Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, where for 37 years we have engaged the public in reflection and dialogue on the key issues of our day from an ethical perspective. Our hour-long forums are free and open to all, and we invite you to join us in the sanctuary at Westminster Church for the spring 2018 season. Our speakers and dates will be announced in early January at westminsterforum.org and on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn as well. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm senior minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church located on Nicollet Mall in beautiful downtown Minneapolis, and I'm the moderator of the forum. It's my pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker. James Foreman, Jr. is a professor of law at Yale Law School, teaching and writing on criminal procedure, constitutional law, juvenile justice, and education law and policy. He's the author of the 2017 National Book Award nominee, Locking Up Our Own, Crime and Punishment in Black America. A graduate of Brown University and Yale Law School, he served as a law clerk for Judge William Norris of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit and for Justice Sandra Day O'Connor of the United States Supreme Court. Before joining the faculty of Yale Law School, he worked for six years as a public defender in Washington, D.C., where he founded the Maya Angelou Public Charter School, an alternative school serving young people who have been incarcerated or who have dropped out of school. The school now provides education for youth currently inside the District of Columbia's juvenile prison. Today, our speaker will explore themes from his new book, including the origins of mass incarceration and its impact on the African-American community. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, James Foreman, Jr. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate the kind introduction, and I appreciate everybody from, from Westminster who has, has welcomed, me, uh, welcomed me here. I want to acknowledge in particular the students that have joined us, and I want to acknowledge their teachers as well. Uh, thank you for the work that you're doing, and thank you for bringing these students uh, with us, uh, to us today. I want to mention in particular, to, this is to the students, but this is really to everybody. You know, when I was, when I was younger, my family sometimes struggled with, with resources. And one of the things I always told myself is that when I had a book, when I wrote a book, I was going to make the book available to people at whatever price they could afford. So what I want to say, I don't want to make this clear to the students, but to make it clear to everybody that's part of this community is that when you come to purchase a book, uh, you should pay either the price that the bookseller is asking or you should pay whatever it is that you feel like you're able to pay and you will get a book and I will sign the book. So let me start by talking about why I decided to write this book, what my motivations were. And my motiv main motivation came out of my work as a public defender. There are a lot of stories in this book. There's history, there's argument, but ultimately it's a book of stories. And one of the stories that I tell in the introduction is of a young man I represented by the name of Brandon. Brandon had pled guilty to possession of a gun possession of a small amount of marijuana, $15, $20 worth. And I was the lawyer that had been appointed to represent him. And I had taken the job because I viewed the work as the civil rights issue of my generation. See, my parents met in the original civil rights movement. They met in the 1960s. They met in SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. My dad is black and my mom is white. They were an interracial couple at a time when those marriages were illegal in many states in this country. And their generation changed America profoundly. And I say their generation, but I know that there's people in this room. I'm not going to call you out. But I know there's people in this room that are part of that generation or part of that struggle. When I say their, if this means you, then I mean your as well. There in your generation, faced down Bull Connor's dogs, marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, came to D.C. 250,000 strong for the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. They made it possible 
for an African-American man of my generation to have opportunities that were unimaginable to a black man of my father's generation growing up as he did in de jure segregated Mississippi, de facto segregated Chicago. But at the same time, at the same time, I could also see the unfinished business of the civil rights movement, and it was manifesting itself in our criminal legal system. We didn't have the term mass incarceration when I became a public defender. That's a term that was created in the year 2000. But we already knew that one in three young black men was under criminal justice supervision. We already knew from that same report by the Sentencing Project that black women were the largest single growing portion of our prison system. We already knew that in the late 1980s, the United States had passed Russia and South Africa to earn the dishonor of being the nation's largest incarcerator. Sorry, world's largest incarcerator. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. 5% of the world's population, 25% of the world's prisoners. So that brought me to be standing next to Brandon. I was asking for him to get probation. I had a letter from a teacher and a counselor. It was his first arrest. His mother and grandmother were sitting in court. They were there as they had been. Every court hearing, they wanted to, to come home. The prosecutor in the case was asking for him to be locked up. She wanted him to go to Oak Hill, D.C.'s juvenile prison. This place was a dungeon, no functioning school, like so many juvenile facilities in our country. No job training programs, drugs and violence rampant, a place that you always left worse off than when you entered. The judge in the case had to make the decision. The judge had to make the decision was Judge I changed his name, and I'm always at risk of mentioning his actual name, so I want to make sure that I get his right. His name was Curtis Walker. And I changed his name because I wanted to protect the privacy of my clients. I didn't want anybody to be able to figure out who these cases were actually about, but they're real stories. And Judge Walker looked out at the courtroom, and he saw Brandon, a young black man, facing sentencing. That's not unusual. You go to D.C. Superior Court, you would think that they're no white people who live in D.C. based on who's facing charges. African-American defense attorney, African-American prosecutor, the judge himself is African-American. That's not unusual. 40% of the judges in Superior Court in Washington, D.C. are African-American. Judge Walker looks out at the courtroom, and he says, son, as he looks into Brandon, Mr. Foreman's been telling me that you've had a tough life, that you deserve a second chance. Well, let me tell you about tough, son. Let me tell you about Jim Crow segregation. See, the judge had been a child in those years, so he lectured Brandon on what that was like. And then he said, so here's the thing. People fought, people marched, people died for your freedom. Dr. King died for you. And I tell you this, he didn't die for you to be running and gunning and thugging and carrying on and embarrassing your family and embarrassing your community carrying that gun. No, that was not his dream at all. So I hope Mr. Foreman is right. I hope you turn it around. But right now, today, in this courtroom, actions have consequences. And your consequence is Oak Hill. You locked him up. And I was so angry and frustrated on that day. And as I began, though, to kind of work through those feelings of anger and frustration, and as you can see, it's still a process, I began to reflect on the fact that there was a story that needed to be told because the judge wasn't alone. The city council that passed the gun and the drug laws that Brandon was sentenced under was a majority African-American city council. The police force in D.C. was majority black. The police chief was black. The chief prosecutor in the city was none other than Eric Holder. And even with all that representation, I told you that one in three young black men na nationally was under criminal justice supervision, but in DC it was one in two. And so I felt like somebody needed to go back and write the history of the last 50 years through the lens of that first generation of African-American elected officials to tell 
the challenges and the struggles and the constraints that they were operating under to try to figure out how it could be that so many in my own community, as the nation was building the world's largest prison system, as America was building the world's largest prison system, how it was that so many in my own community went along for the ride. And that's the topic of the book. That's what I'm writing about. Now, we could stop now, and everybody could go buy a book. <laughs> and my, my, my son is eight. They have uh, sustained silent reading in his class in third grade, where everybody gets a book, and they open it up, and they read for as long as they can without anybody speaking out. And the kids haven't learned yet that if they just interrupt, like after 30 seconds, they can stop the exercise. So he comes home, Dad, we made it for 25 minutes today. <laughs> but y'all came out for this talk, so let me, let me say something about the main arguments of the book. The first thing that we have to understand to figure out how we got here is rising crime and violence and addiction in African-American communities over the last 50 years, especially in the 1960s, and then again in the 1980s. A lot of my students, when I talk to them about the war on drugs, they remember crack. But heroin in the 1960s was, in black America, the crack before there was crack. The homicide rate in this country doubled in the 1960s. It tripled in Washington, D.C. Heroin. They test everyone entering the D.C. jail for drugs, and in 1963, they concluded that 4% of the people entering the jail were heroin addicts. By 1969, the 4% had become 45%. Now, that's an epidemic. And it wasn't just the numbers, it was also the fear and the anger that they generated. I reviewed hundreds, hundreds, thousands of letters from mostly African-American cities to the citizens to their representatives in the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s. And when you read these letters, you see a community that's in anguish. You see people desperate for protection, writing to their elected officials saying, like, I feel like a prisoner in my own home. I feel like a stranger on my own streets. Do something, do something. You have to do something about it. Now, who's receiving these letters? That's the second main argument in the book. The generation that's receiving these letters is the first generation of black elected officials to come into office in this country in the 1970s and 1980s. Nationally, there was an 800% increase in African-American elected officials in those years after the passage of the Voting Rights Act, 1965. This was a generation, many of them were from the South, some of them were in the Civil Rights Movement with my parents. All of them remember the long history of under-enforcement and under-protection my dad used to tell me about this. He said, Mississippi, we didn't call the police in the black community. We didn't call them because we knew they weren't going to come. And if they came, they were only going to make matters worse. This generation knows that history. Now they're in office. They have some measure of control. And they are bound and determined to make sure that the law does respond to those letter writers, to make sure that that community does get the protection that it's asking for. But all of this raises the question, why police and prosecutors in prisons? Why is that the protection that's being offered? And here is where my story, although it's a story of African-American elected officials in cities across this country, it's also a story of the larger constraints that they were under. And here are some of those constraints. The first constraint is historical. Black elected officials in this country have been elected to represent communities that because of a history of slavery, Jim Crow, redlining, disenfranchisement, federal highway policies where when they had to put the highway down somewhere, they invariably put it through the middle of black neighborhoods. And so they're elected to represent communities that have been deprived of the resources to protect themselves. The second limitation is a question of local versus national. The people that I'm writing about are local elected officials. African-American political power has always been concentrated in cities. And local's important, but there are limits to it. 
So what you see for the last 50 years is generations of black elected officials going to Congress and saying things like, we want more police and more prosecutors, yes. But we also want more money for job training. We want more money for health care. We want more money for housing. We want more money for mental health. We want national gun control. We're passing local gun control laws, but you've got to pass national gun control, Congress. We want a Marshall Plan for urban America. We want the United States government to invest in black communities the way it invested in Europe after World War II to rebuild, to revitalize. They go for 50 years asking for this all of the above strategy to fighting crime and violence, and they come back consistently with money for one of the above. Law enforcement, police, prisons. Last constraint that I'll mention, and it's a constraint that I think we all suffer from still to this day, and it's constraint of imagination. Now, what do I mean by that? I'll give you an example. Somebody that I write about is a guy named David Clark, one of the first city council members, Washington, D.C., mid-1970s. David Clark, is a, he's, a, he's a white member of the city council. He's got an unusual biography for a white guy of that time. He went to Howard Law School in the 1960s. Then he worked for Martin Luther King. He gets out. He's a fighter for racial justice. He gets elected to the city council. And the first thing he does is he fights for marijuana decriminalization. All good so far. Right? He's not a drug warrior. A few years later, though, he's the chair of the city council. And those letters that I told you about, they start picking up because heroin, which had stepped back in the 1970s, is back in force in the 1980s. And more and more citizens are saying things like, there's an addict in front of my house. There's a junkie. I don't just endorse this language, but that's the language that letters use. There's a junkie nodding off on my porch. Do something. Dave Clark gets these letters, forwards them to the head of the relevant government agency, gets a letter back saying, Councilmember Clark, this happens over and over again, we've received your citizen complaint about an addict. And then Clark takes all those letters and sends them to the citizen. Here's the thing, though. Who does this non-drug warrior, marijuana decriminalizer, send the letters to when he, remember, the complaint is there's an addict in public space. Does he send it to the head of the Department of Mental Health? Counseling, addiction services, social work? No. He's not a drug warrior, but he's an American. And like so many of us, he's constrained by his imagination. He sends it to the police chief. Because in this country, we've come to think of problems like an addict in public space as a problem that requires somebody to show up with a gun and handcuffs, not a counselor to show up. And my argument in the book is that it's tiny decisions like those, things that we tend to, get, tend to get lost, but it's tiny decisions like which agency do you call upon to respond to a crisis in your community? It's those tiny decisions that in total are the bricks that built the prison nation that America has become. Now, I have a couple minutes left before we get to Q&A. And I want, in those minutes, to focus on a couple of things that we can do in response to this crisis. I was told that a lot of people that have come in here are motivated on this issue, know something about this issue, care about criminal justice reform. I was handed a recent report that has just been written, I don't think it's been disseminated yet, but it's been written by this church and it should be available on their website in about another month or so about the crisis in criminal justice in this community and it's a locally focused report. And I want, in my last couple of minutes, to focus on local responses because I do believe that if we're going to take down mass incarceration and replace it with something more humane, more just, it's going to be a local fight. It's going to be a neighborhood by neighborhood, block by block, city by city, county by county, state house by state house fight. 88% of prisoners in this country are in state and local prisons, not the federal ones. 85% of law enforcement in this country is state and local, not federal. 
And Minnesota, y'all, and this is a national problem, and y'all know it's a problem here. Second highest racial disparities in the criminal justice system of any state in the nation. African Americans locked up 10 to 1. 10 times more likely to be locked up in this state than white Americans in this same state. So this is a national problem. Okay, a couple of things. Who's your state, who's your local prosecutor? Who's your local sheriff? And what are you holding them accountable for? Progressives rally around the, elect, the national elections every four years. I'm bombarded with calls and deluged with email requests from the Democratic National Committee, and I know it's a church, I'm not supposed to be political, but whoever your national committee is. But locally, state, county prosecutors and sheriffs drive this. And I understand that there's an election coming up here for the prosecutor and the sheriff. And I would encourage you to don't just accept their statements that I'm a progressive prosecutor. Find out what their positions are. Hold their feet to the fire. Ask them about racial profiling. Ask them about the use of money bonds. Ask them about prosecution of low-level drug offenders. Ask them about their support, support for restorative justice. And then hold them accountable. Second thing is your public defender's offices. This book that I wrote is in many ways a tribute to the role that a well-financed, well-funded public defender office can have. But in most places in this country, those offices are underfunded and under-resourced. I was given the name of a couple of organizations, I want to mention them, the Legal Rights Center here in Minneapolis and the Neighborhood Justice Center in St. Paul. These are two public defender offices that are doing holistic style reform. And I encourage y'all, this is giving, close to Giving Tuesday, I think we're just a day off, to look at those organizations and see if you want to find a way to support them. The third idea that I want to leave you all with is going inside. You know, Brian Stevenson talks a lot about this idea of proximity. You've got to get proximity. You've got to get close to the issue. As long as it remains abstract, it feels overwhelming. So get inside. Most of your local jails and prisons have volunteering opportunities. There's tutoring opportunities. There's mentoring opportunities. We built up a system where the people we incarcerate are so far away, are so far removed, that it's up to all of us to demolish that. I do it my own self, myself and my own teaching. I teach a course called Inside Out. This is a course that I've taught for years at Yale Law School on race in the criminal justice system. But then last year, I changed, changed it up. Now I teach the class inside a Connecticut prison. And the class is made up of 10 men that are, are incarcerated and 10 law students. It's absolutely transformative for everybody in the room. For everybody in the room. I tell my colleagues, don't teach this class to get good teaching evaluations, though it's true that the best evaluations I get in any class are this one. <laughs> but the most meaningful ones are from, from some of the men who are incarcerated. One of them wrote at the end of our last class, he wrote, what I love the most about this class is that for two hours every week, I come into class and I'm treated like I'm smart. I'm treated like I have something to say. I'm treated, and on some days, I even feel like an intellectual. That's powerful, right? That's powerful. And then he wrote, and this is the depressing part, I never felt that way in school before. Another young man wrote, for two hours a week, I can kind of sort of, a little bit, forget that I'm in prison. And that's liberating, right? That's liberating. One more idea, that I, concrete idea that I want to leave you with, something that's going on right here in, in your state, is the fight for full citizenship. There's 51,000 people in Minnesota that cannot vote because of felony convictions. There's an organization, Restore the Vote Minnesota. Thank you if you're involved. If you're not, get involved. That's trying to change that. It doesn't have to be this way. There's many states in this country that, have, that allow 
more of their returning citizens to vote than Minnesota does. So get involved in that, because as long as we tell people that for the rest of your life, or for an unbelievably long time, you will never be able to come back into full citizenship. You serve your time, you're incarcerated, now you're out. But we will forever stigmatize you, we will forever humiliate you, we will forever exclude you from the body politic. How can we ever expect to become a whole nation, a whole community? This last thing that I wanna say, and I'll close here, it's not a particular policy proposal. It's really a way of thinking about the issue. And it comes from a conversation that I had with my father. We had watched a movie about the civil rights movement, and I wanted to know what he thought of it, you know, having been there and everything. And he said he liked it. He liked because he liked it because he said, you know, not everybody reads books. People watch movies now. He, you know, he, did, he told me that before I wrote the book, so maybe I should have listened to him <laughs> and made a movie instead. He said, I like that they showed the history on the screen. He said, what I didn't like is that they made it seem like everybody was in the movement. He said, it wasn't like that. It's like, we were lonely. We were unpopular. We were hated. He said, I used to go on college campuses to try to recruit people to join SNCC. They ran me off the campus. School administrators wouldn't let them on. He said, the tactics that they valorize and celebrate now, when we were doing them, they said they weren't going to work. Why are you breaking the law? Why are you taking over buildings? 60% of Americans predicted that the March on Washington for jobs and freedom was going to hurt the cause of the Negro in a Gallup poll. And then later, everybody says they were there. <laughs> so this is my dad's point, that when you're facing this challenge that appears insurmountable, slavery, Jim Crow, I would say today, mass incarceration, people will tell you that change is impossible. And when you ignore them, especially the students, ignore people who tell you it's impossible. When you ignore them and when you rally and when you vote and when you demand accountability of your local elected officials and when you get voting rights back for returning citizens, right? when you do these things and you win, and you create the change, the same people that told you that change was impossible will turn around and say, oh, that was inevitable. I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> so I don't know who in this room is probably going to be somebody in the balcony. But I don't know what group of people in this room together is going to have the idea, is going to create the organization, is going to launch the march. Right, who's going to launch the initiative that is going to help us develop a criminal system that is actually worthy of its name and worthy of the name of this nation. But somebody is going to do it. And when you do, they're going to make a movie about you. <laughs> and then we're going to be here, we're going to be here in the front row with popcorn. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, James Foreman, Jr. You're, you're listening to the Westminster Town Hall Forum broadcast from Westminster Presbyterian Church on Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister here at Westminster Church and moderator of the forum. Our speaker today is James Foreman, Jr., author of the book, Locking Up Our Own, Crime and Punishment in Black America. While the ushers collect questions from the in-house audience, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's forum. Hennepin County Library, with funding from the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Fund, United Theological Seminary of the Twin Cities and its Kaleo Center, and the online news source, MinPost. <laughs>
And now, Professor Foreman, if you would return to the pulpit, I will present the questions from our audience. First question has to do with schools and the relationship between public schools in America and incarceration, the connection between public schools and incarceration, sometimes referred to as the school to prison pipeline. Uh, I, I see you've started an alternative school, a charter school. Uh, are our public schools contributing to the problem of mass incarceration? What can we do about that? I guess in some sense, public schools are, or in part, in, in, in the way that, in, a, in the sense that we all are. So we all, one, right, one of my arguments is that there's shared responsibility for the problem and then shared responsibility for the solution. So I think that there are people within our public education system that are working passionately and valiantly to respond to and to combat uh, things like the school to prison pipeline and things like mass incarceration, we know, what we know is that there's nothing more powerful, nothing more powerful to your chances of life success, to your chances of being able to get a job where you can support your family, and your chances of never getting involved in the criminal system, never getting incarcerated. There's nothing more powerful that you can do. You can never fully protect yourself, and in a racist America, minority groups and African Americans in particular are always going to be the most at risk. So there's no pure protection. But the best thing that anybody can do to protect themselves is to graduate from high school and to go to college and to graduate from college. That That said, the school to prison pipeline is a real issue, and what that idea refers to is the concept that especially for very low-level offenses, people are often getting dragged into the juvenile justice system. I won't tell this story in full because it will take too much time, but I represented somebody when I was in juvenile court, and he was charged with ADW, that's assault with a deadly weapon, and then in parentheses, where it normally would say knife or gun or stick, in parentheses, y'all, it said chocolate milk. <laughs> and the underlying offense was an argument in the school cafeteria that led my client, allegedly, to throw a carton. You know, little, they barely give you any milk. Those little cartons of chocolate milk at somebody else. He was in handcuffs in a prison cell facing a judge. That's the school-to-prison pipeline. Having said that, I want to point out one other thing. If you want to get involved in dismantling that, one very powerful way is to run for your local school board, because those decisions are made at the local school board level. It's not Jeff Sessions, it's not Donald Trump, and it's probably not whoever else is on your Twitter feed. It's at the level of the local school board. What about early childhood education? Using your imagination or our imagination, what can we do to begin early in a child's life to prevent the problems that you've described? Sometimes people in this, in this area, like, we feel like we have to come up with new ideas, right? And funders are looking for, like, something new. And every once in a while, there's an idea that has been around for a long time, has been thoroughly well studied, has had researchers document it every which way, up, down, and in between. And it's been shown to produce educated and productive adults, and it's been shown to protect against becoming involved in the criminal justice system. And one of those ideas, one of the few time-tested, proven ideas is robust investment in early childhood education. So this is one, y'all, we're like straight up. We don't have to figure out a new plan. Like, we don't have to have a new strategy. We just have to fund and expand the existing realm of early childhood programs that we already have. This, this question comes from a group from the court that's in uh, the audience today. What role has the Supreme Court played in the mass incarceration of people of color? Oh, not a good one. <laughs> not a good one. I, I, honestly, one of the hard, the, uh, for me, 
I, I won't, I'm not going to, again, time does, won't permit me to go into this story in any detail, but there's a story that I had never told before uh, that came up in a conversation that I had with uh, Terry Gross on, on Fresh Air. And if you're pressed for time, go find that interview and then just go to like the last six or seven minutes because I think it's the last question she asked me. And it, uh, she asked me about what it was like clerking on the Supreme Court. And there's a story that I, that I tell there that, that might be of interest to whoever asked that question. But um, the Supreme Court has played an absolutely... Uh, a terrible role in, in so many ways. So uh, the Supreme Court has, in the context of the Eighth Amendment, for example, cruel and unusual punishment, the Supreme Court has interpreted that extremely, extremely narrowly, allowing all manner of abuse and degradation and violations to happen and hel be held to be consistent with the United States Constitution. The Supreme Court has interpreted the Fourth Amendment again, to be uh, extremely narrowly and to permit all sorts of what I would say would be a, abusive police tactics. The one that I write about the most in the, in the book is in chapter six of the book, uh, and it's on the question of pretext stops, where the police can stop you for any basis. If they have any valid reason to pull the car over, and any experienced officer will tell you, give me 60 seconds, and I can find a valid reason on any driver. And what the Supreme Court has said is that if they have a valid reason, then it doesn't even matter. We're not even going to ask the question whether what was going on in their mind was actually racial profiling. We're just going to say, well, they had a valid basis, and therefore uh, the stop is going to be constitutional. And then the area that I find in some ways, we, which we talk about the least, but I think is extremely important, is the right to counsel. I talked about the right to counsel being a foundational uh, bedrock right in our system, but it's only a right if you have the right to effective assistance of counsel. If you have a lawyer that's got 300, 400 cases, if you've got a lawyer that's got no training, if you've got a lawyer that's being coerced by judges or other actors in the judicial system, if you have a lawyer who is asleep during closing arguments, all of this has been held to be consistent with the effective assistance of counsel by the Supreme Court. And I have to say, on a personal level, I love, I love Justice O'Connor, the justice that I worked for, um, and she's been a great treasure in my life. But she uh, was uh, the author of the opinion in one of the effective assistance, ineffective assistance of counsel cases, and I still haven't stopped pestering her about it. <laughs> I wish she would, it's too late for her to change her mind, but. As a public defender, you worked with a number of young people, students, uh, and there, are, here's a question here from a student. How can, how can teachers advocate for students inside and outside school when they're faced with legal trouble? The role of teachers. A lot. Obviously, fundamentally, the role of teachers, right, is to, uh, is to expose you to a classroom environment that is rigorous, with a curriculum that is relevant, where they're committed to developing individual relationships with students and supporting and nurturing you. And one thing that I would say to teachers, and I, I experience this both as a teacher and also as a parent, you know, it can, I, I think there are a lot of times when teachers get, you know, frustrated because it's such a hard job. And, I, and I, I've taught high school. I know how hard of a job it is. Um, and there's times where it can be easy for us to forget as teachers the obstacles that our students are encountering that we don't even know about on that particular day. We like might know in the abstract that students have these challenges, but we don't know that on this particular day, what happened to that student that's misbehaving or being defiant in front of me is they lost a loved one, or they saw a friend be shot, or the gas or the heat was just cut off. All of these things are real things that go on in our students' lives, and as much as possible, we have to enter into the classroom with that kind of understanding, which doesn't mean don't have rules. Of course, you have to have rules, um, but it means having a kind of a compassion um, that you bring with you as you enforce those rules. And in terms of outside the courtroom, because the question was also about outside the classroom, 
I think teachers can be uh, an incredible resource when in everybody that I represented in juvenile court and even the teenagers that I represented in adult court, letters from teachers and in situations where the teacher actually would come to court, I was transformative. I was transformative. And here's the funny thing about judges. And I, judges, I mean, don't take this the wrong way if y'all are judges, but like judges, judges don't like really like defense lawyers that much. Like you just, like judges who will be like super nice in like the supermarket, they get hard and, and mean looking when the defense lawyer starts talking. In my experience, like no matter what you're about to say, I don't want to believe it, but they believe other people. They believe teachers. No, seriously. Seriously, y'all, this happened to me in real life. On Because there was a time when I was working as a public defender and a teacher, part-time public defender, full-time starting the school. And there was one day that I went down to court, and I, was, I had a few clients left, and I went in, and the judge was the normal, Miss Foreman, what you got? Nah, 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 you know, like that. And then I came in as the teacher. Hello, Mr. Foreman. Thank you. And it was a different judge, granted, but it was on the same day. And I'm sure that it was my role. So what I want to say is, as teachers, go, stand up, speak out, raise your voices, educate the judges, because here's the problem with the criminal system. The judge only sees the facts of what happened. They only see the prosecutor's account of what happened. They can't see the whole person. But you as the teacher, you can come and tell that judge who the whole person is. So please do it when you can. I have several comments from students who observe that as a child of a white mother and an African-American father, you have the privilege of passing as white. How does that uh, affect your perspective on these issues and, and your engagement in activism? Well, I think that it is, it absolutely has an effect. I mean, it has an effect on my day-to-day -day reality. It has an effect on how, how I'm be treated by police officers, most clearly and obviously. Um, the, you know, growing up in Atlanta, one of the interesting things about growing up in Atlanta was there's such a huge, the African-American community in Atlanta has this really broad spectrum of, of complexions. Uh, and I mean, we have that everywhere, um, but I feel, like, I feel like in Atlanta, was, it was a kind of especially uh, present and predominant. And one of the things, one of the choices that I guess parents have to make when they raise their children is what, are the, what is going to be their children's racial orientation. Obviously, the child ultimately, especially as the child becomes a teenager and is an adult, is going to make that decision for him or herself. But what the parent does in the early years really matters quite a lot. And one of the reasons that my mom actually moved us, so my parents split up when I was uh, seven or eight years old, and, we were, and my mom raised us. We were, and my dad was involved in our life, but, but my mom was the day-to-day. -day. She decided where we were going to where we were going to live. And she moved us to Atlanta, where she had lived in the 1960s, but then had left. She moved us to Atlanta in part because there was such a um, kind of robust uh, African-American political class. When you open the newspaper in Atlanta uh, and you look at who's making decisions as a city council, you see mostly African-American representatives. When you see the picture of the mayor, you see typically uh, and when I was a child, you see a black man or a black woman. And my mom wanted us, as, as, white, as a white woman who was raising two black boys, so the first thing is she raised us to consider ourselves, Af she and my father both raised us to consider ourselves African American. And as a mixed race, as a black father and a white mother of, uh, of two boys who they were raising as black, my mom thought it was very important that I grow up in an environment where it was regular and routine for me to see African Americans making important decisions. She didn't want me, she didn't want that to be something that I, I, I didn't get to know and I didn't get to see. So I think that their choices that they made to raise us in a spirit of activism, to raise us as uh, two young men that uh, were thought of ourselves as African-American, who lived in a majority African-American community, I think that those, uh, 
choices have, 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 have never left me. They've, they've shaped who I am to this day, and they've shaped how I operate in the world. They've shaped my political commitments. Um, they've shaped how I carry myself. If, if you could describe what, what role community, community policing has had in, in uh, addressing the, the mass incarceration that we're facing as a nation. Well, community policing has a lot of potential, but unfortunately, it, that potential has often been unrealized. So the basic, and it kind of depends, we have to figure out, first of all, what we mean by community policing, because what happened in what happened is a lot of police departments will put community policing, like they'll slap that on the police car. Nothing changes about how they operate but for the words on the police car. And that's not, so whatever community policing is, it's not that, right? It's not just the, the words on the police car. Um, what, in my mind, what community policing actually is, is it's when members of the police department bring themselves into communities, the communities that are most affected by aggressive policing, the most affected by crime and violence, the communities that want policing desperately but don't want this kind of policing that you've been giving us, right? Bring yourself into that community and begin a conversation and a dialogue with community members and you have to enter into it willing to listen and here's the other thing, because a lot of people say they'll listen. But here's the thing, you have to enter into the conversation willing to change. You have to be willing to listen and then change what you do based on the listening. Because what's been happening typically is the first level is put it on the police car. The next level is go to the community meeting with your arms folded, not listening. The next level is go to the community meeting and listen and go and keep doing the same thing you're always doing. And what real community policing is, in my mind, is go to the meeting, listen, and then change your practices based on what you've heard, come back to the community and say, here are the changes that we implemented based on what we heard, what do you think of them? Give us some feedback. And that kind of conversation that goes back and forth over time, in my mind, that's real community policing, and it's happening in a couple of places in this country, but not most. Many in the room are familiar with Michelle Alexander's book, The, the New Jim Crow. And some have interpreted your work, your essays and reviews of her work as uh, either refuting it or, or somehow taking issue with, with her perspectives. Could you comment on that? Absolutely. I don't, I don't think, I think her work is fabulous and important and groundbreaking, and I'm so glad that it has been so widely read. It's being so widely read in high schools, it's being so widely read in colleges, it's being so widely read uh, in congregations, it's being so widely read by politicians. And you'll see, if, if, if you make it to the epilogue of my book, you will see that there's a chapter in which I talk about how African American politicians in the D.C. Council in particular went back to that marijuana decriminalization decision that Dave Clark had initially proposed in 1975, and this time they came up with a different outcome. In 2014, they decriminalized marijuana. And one of the, there are lots of reasons, there are lots of forces. The church was active in support of decriminalization in 2014, the black church in a way that it had not been in 75. But one of the reasons was Michelle Alexander's book. People cited it. I mean, who, get, who writes a book that's cited in DC council hearings and there was an organization there called the New Jim Crow Group for Change. I mean, when a group, for, when a citizen action group names themselves after your book, and then goes and lobbies, then you have achieved something significant as an author. My, I don't, and I don't view this book that I just wrote, uh, Lock, Locking Up Our Own, I don't view it as in any way challenging or contesting uh, the core thesis of her book. In a lot of ways, I actually think of the book as an extension in some ways, because what, what I think the book shows is how deeply embedded how thoroughly entrenched the impulse towards punitive, punitiveness became in this country over the last 40 or 50 years. How thoroughly so many of us got caught up in it. 
Not everybody, and you'll see when you read the book, there's also, at every step of the way, I, I raise the point of people that were opposed, right? People that were advocating against mandatory minimums in 1980 and 1981 and 1982. But on the whole, as a country, we moved in that direction, including many of us in the African-American community. And to me, that just shows exactly how powerful and profound and deep-seated the punitive impulse was and is. You've been involved in, in these issues on incarceration in many, at many levels as a uh, clerking for, for Supreme Court justice and, and at a public defender level, you've, you've been educated at some of the best schools and you've worked with some of the toughest schools. Uh, are you, and this is the last question, are you hopeful? Are you hopeful for America and this is it we face what we face with this incarceration issue? I'm hopeful for the reasons that I suggested at the end of my opening remarks. That is to say, I'm hopeful because in my mind, and this was a very important part of my parents, my father and my mother's, how they chose to raise us. I mean, we talked earlier about you know, racial identification, but racial identification is only part of the picture, right? Because when you, are African American, one of the things that that means is that you're connected to and formed by a history of struggle, a history of resistance to oppression, a history of figuring out a way to read when they wouldn't let us read, of figuring out a way to get educated when they defunded schools in black communities around this country of figuring out a way to vote when registrars, right, in Mississippi and Alabama and elsewhere came, with, came up with increasingly complicated and Byzantine and bizarre tests to try to keep people from voting, right, of figuring out a way to feed your children in a society that seems often uh, dedicated to keeping you from being able to get and keep full employment. So in my mind, that history of struggle, that history of resistance is a source, a constant for me, source of inspiration. And I feel like so many people, it's kind of like going back to that judge, right, in the beginning of the story. I just reach a different conclusion from him, but we're both drawing on the same history. I know that people fought. I know that people marched. I know that people died for my freedom for African-American freedom. And in my mind, I feel like I don't have any choice but to be optimistic. What else are you going to do? Thank you, James Foreman, Jr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.